high school sports, we've got it covered. Overtime starts now. Hello and welcome to Overtime. I'm Scott Lubber. And I'm Drew Collins. We're glad you could join us. We've got your highlights ready to roll and Tim Bailey ready to break down some Nick 10 games. And we're going to spotlight Hananiga's Benson brothers. Two bigs on the line who are big reasons why Hananiga should be headed for another great season. Let's begin with the smaller schools tonight and begin in the Big Northern Conference where Byron is king of the hill until somebody else proves otherwise. The Tigers steamrolled everyone in the conference last year. Could a speedy Rockford Lutheran team give the Tigers a run for their money tonight? It's the Gillies heating and air conditioning game of the week. The defending state champs picked right up where they left off. The end zone. Caden Considine takes it 79 yards early in the first quarter. Talk about making a statement. The Byron highlight reel continues. This next shot is, it's time for 16 for six. That's Andrew Talbert. Look at the size of the hole set by the big boys up front. That is just too easy for Byron's playmakers. And one of my favorite players in the conference, Braden Knoll. He gets his time to shine. He walks into the end zone untouched. That is too easy. Rockford Lutheran looking to make some plays here on offense. They're just trying to get some yards downfield. And the young man, Andrew Talbert, making plays all over the field tonight. He snags the pick and sets up the offense. And last but not least, I have to shout this kid out. Everyone welcome Caden McGow. This kid is a freshman. Get ready to hear his name a lot over the next four years. The Byron Tigers dominate the Crusaders 49 to 18. And just down the road from Byron, Stillman Valley hosted Rock Falls. It was alumni night. Many former Cardinals dating back to the 50s were shown some love. Get ready to see some Brock Needs bully ball. This kid wears number 31, and that might be for how many touchdowns he has this year. He's a wrecking ball. Cardinals up 30 to six in the third. The Rockets looking to fight back. Quarterback Trail Stonich rolls out to his right, pump fakes and finds Maverick Johnson for a sneaky touchdown in the back of the end zone. 30 to 14 to start the fourth. The Cardinals were fast to answer. They decide to feed Brock Needs and he ate. Brock literally carries about five Rock Falls players for the big game. Anybody still hungry for some more bully ball? Big 3-1 is back for more. Another goal line score will put the Cardinals out of reach. Stillman Valley walks away with a 14-38 win at home. That's a typical Stillman fullback for you. Also in the Big Northern Conference, Dixon tops Oregon 35-0. Genoa Kingston defeated North Boone 34-0. All right, let's jump over to the Northwest Upstate Illini Conference and Duran Dupac hosting EPC. EPC starting things off. Draymond Zier bouncing outside, down the left side, pushed out of bounds there. Later, it's the QB keeper, Jackson Corbin, plowing ahead. Look at that. Look at tug of war in there. <laughs> oh, the bigs from EPC getting the push for the touchdown. They're going to go for two, triple option here. The old flip going to the outside. That's Zier with his speed. He's in there again. And it was eighth and nothing Wildcats. Dupax ball now, Cooper Hoffman off to Ethan Rager. They, he has the grab, the ball, and the EPC. He lost it. It's an EPC recovery. Riverman then would force a punt. Second quarter, Hoffman gives it up to Lucas Rosso, who jukes to a lead elude before getting brought down in Wildcats territory. Hoffman then following suit with a QB keeper. He's got the touchdown. Dupac went on to score another 30 unanswered points wow. to pull away and win 36 to eight. On to Forreston, when the Cardinals hosted Dakota, both teams looking for their first wins. Brady Gill, the QB, gonna give it up to Dane Setterstrom. Little power rush up the middle for four yards down there in the red zone. Cardinals gonna go for two here. And Gill with a play action, quickly tosses to an open Caden Hoffman that's a conversion following the touchdown. On fourth and long at the 20, Cameron Neubauer of Dakota gonna blitz, and he will sack Brady Gill. It's a turnover on downs, what a play there. Forreston's next possession, Gill needs feed Setterstrom for his second TD, that's from four yards out. It was 16 to nothing after the two-pointer. Fourth and goal here for the Cards. Gill and company just pushing their way, shoving, shoving there into the end zone again for the TD. Forced and shut out Dakota 38 to nothing in its home opener. Two NUIC teams that got off to robust starts last week were Fulton and Lena Winslow. They met tonight and Lena, Rian Weil was all over that game. She joins us now. Hi, Rian. 
Yeah, guys, last week, Fulton dominated Forreston 28 to nothing. Lena Winslow thumped Morrison 32 to six. So the stage was set for a big battle tonight in this one, and they delivered. Lee Wynn came out strong, scoring just two minutes into the first quarter when quarterback Kosh Lesman handed it off to Alex Schlichting, and he was on his way to his first touchdown of the night, making it six to nothing with 10 to go in the first quarter. Just seven minutes later, he does it again, battling the defenders and coming out of it. You can just hear the crowd roaring for this one. He extends the Panthers' lead to 12, and look at him go. But you've got to give some defense and the credit to the Fulton defense. On both Lewin touchdowns, they attempted a two-point conversion, but were stopped just short. And here they are again, this time Fulton's Mason Kubel jumping up for a big block, knocking this one down and forcing a Lee win fourth down. Now Fulton did get themselves on the board just before halftime. QB Dom Kramer threw to Jacob Husanga, who ran this one down. Here he's outrunning the defense, but was unfortunately out of bounds near the 30 yard line. So although he slid into this one, he didn't get the credit for it. But to get the touchdown, Kramer hands it off to Skylar Crooks, who pushes his way through to add some points for the Steamers with just a minute 43 to go in the half. They too went for the two-point conversion here, but were quickly brought down by the Panthers' defense. This was a close game for sure, but Lee Wynn came out on top 44-13. That Fulton defense did an outstanding job holding the 2023 state runner-ups to just two touchdowns in the first half. I bet that's going to carry them pretty far this season. Guys, back to you. All right, thank you, Rianne. Also in the NUIC, Galena beat Morrison 34-9, still waiting on the stockton Schulzberg score up in Wisconsin. An eight-man football action, still waiting on the Christian Life AFC score, but Polo defeated River Ridge 56-0, Orangeville won 42-20 over South Beloit, and West Carroll won 54-0 over Hiawatha. In other games around the area, Sycamore tapped Oswego East 15-9. That's a weird score. DeKalb fell to Plainfield South 17-14. We're going to focus in on the Nick 10 next. The Harlem Huskies turn their running attack loose on Auburn. We'll have that plus reaction from Tim Bailey. The Harlem Huskies earned a win last week in Jim Morrow's return as head coach. The Auburn Knights had a rough opener up in Hananiga with their new head coach, Leroy McFadden. So tonight, the two new coaches and the teams met up at Harlem. And Got to love a beautiful Husky on a beautiful night for football. Yeah, that's the way to do it at Harlem. And this is the way to do it, too, with our other main Husky. That's Jamani Muhammad. A little run there off the middle. We're going to see more of him. Nate Johnson here is going to dump it off. It's Muhammad who has it and can't quite break that tackle, but that's another nice gain. Now they're going to go right back to Jamani, and here he is. And he is going to be into the end zone for that one. That made it 13-6 to Harlem in the second quarter. More Muhammad to come. They go right back to him as he breaks it outside. Watch the extra effort here. It bounces off a tackle, oh. bounces off another guy. Is he in or not? The officials finally ruled, yep, that's a touchdown. That was his third of the night. And then, folks, with four minutes to go in the third quarter, chaos broke out here at Husky Stadium. Students from the student section just started sprinting, as you see there, across the track toward the north end zone and out to the fences out there. I don't know if there was a student altercation or what. Nobody seemed to know. Uh, uh, law enforcement officials from uh, Winnebago County, Rockford, Loves Park, they were all there. A lot of folks were shaken up because nobody knew exactly what was going on. It was scary there for a few moments, but then everything settled down. And the police, when I left, were still trying to piece everything together. I can tell you only that they did uh, put some students in some police cars, perhaps just to question them, to get their to find out what they knew, what they might have seen or heard. So that's all we really know at this point. But it doesn't seem like, you know, there was anything catastrophic that happened other than there was a whole lot of panic there. And that game was suspended in the third quarter with Harlem leading 20-6. to six. They will continue that, I believe, tomorrow and finish that game. So anyway, uh, we don't really have much more to tell you about that. We'll have more on the news tomorrow. But our Nick 10 analyst, Tim Bailey, joins us now to break down what we did see from the game tonight. Yes. So. Let's focus, uh, Tim, on Jim Morrow, taking over at Harlem for the second time now in his career. What did we see from him tonight in terms of the schemes he wants to run and what identity he wants Harlem to be sure. this year? I think we saw a coach that just really didn't miss a beat. Um, you know, he hasn't been in Harlem in years. He comes back to Harlem. 
He's got a bevy of playmakers. He's, he's, he's understanding how to utilize those kids and get those kids in space. Remember, last year, Jamani Muhammad, we didn't really see him in the passing game a lot last year. But this tonight, as we saw, Coach Moore really utilized Jamani out of the backfield a lot in that passing game. You know, I like what he does. He spreads the field, but he feeds his playmaker. He feeds his playmaker, Muhammad, and I, and I like what he's doing thus far. Jamani had all three Harlem touchdowns. He made some great second efforts. You worked with him all over the summer training or helping to train him. I'm sure you're very proud of, you know, what you saw tonight. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, he played, he played a, a, a stellar game. Um, you, know, um, you know, what can you say about the young man? He's, he, he's committed. He prepared properly. Um, and, you know, he comes out tonight, you know, three touchdowns uh, right before the game was called and really just ran hard, um, you know, making people miss. Is that, that's, that's, his, that's his bread and butter of his game. He's really able to make the first man miss, and he actually displayed that tonight. I'm definitely proud of you know, his actual um, progress over the actual summer. You know, my big question coming into the season is, okay, does, what does Harlem have to go with Muhammad to maybe take some of the pressure off of him? Did you see anything tonight you, from their you, offense that you, might indicate that? You know, right? Scott, you know, what I saw tonight, I didn't really see the broom kid as we saw last week right. in week one. They fed him the ball a lot. I didn't really see him eat tonight a lot, you know, so I'm concerned about that. You know, where was this kid at tonight? You know, Jamani, you know, I noticed in the game he was, he was limping off the field a couple times when they went three and out. You know, I'm concerned about is he, is he injured, is he not injured? You know, because if he's injured and, and he's, got a, he's got an injury, then mm. Broom should have been the guy getting those carries tonight, not Jamani. you got to save your horse. Yeah, well, Broom, Broom has the speed and athleticism to, to really make Absolutely, a nice tandem yeah. there yeah. if they can get yeah. him going. But Definitely. it was pretty clear as this game wore on, that uh, Jamani Muhammad was going to be a workhorse tonight, and that he was. Yeah, he was definitely a workhorse. And, and again, you know, he's going to continue to be that workhorse for Harlem. He's been that workhorse for the last three to four years for Harlem. You know, you don't go away from a kid, a kid like that, not a kid of his caliber. And it was a struggle tonight for Auburn. The Knights have a lot of penalties. They were shorthanded on players tonight. You talked to Coach McFadden at halftime. You know, what did you have in that conversation? Yeah, you know, I talked to Coach McFadden at halftime, and, um, you know, he just very candidly just told me, you know, we got some kids out tonight, some disciplinary issues that we're dealing with. Uh, we're going to deal with that accordingly. Um, you know, he wasn't happy, you know, but he's, he's doing exactly what he said he was going to do over there at Auburn, and that's institute discipline first. And you see tonight he's not playing. He's, he's got he had eight to ten guys out tonight, and that's why Auburn struggled. All right. Well, he's, he's got some cleaning up to do, maybe some purging, some discipline, Absolutely. as he likes to say, yes. Yes. To, to take square away first before yep. they can focus on the he, X's. And, and I think he's going to do that. I think he's All gonna right. Do let's that. take a look at our over under question this week. How many yards will Jamani Muhammad rush for this season? That would include the playoffs if Harlem makes the playoffs. So the over under we have set at 1,250 yards. Muhammad rushed for 1,293 yards last year. And that was in 10 games because Harlem did make the playoffs. So what do you say, Tim? You're going to go over or under that 1250 mark? I'm, I'm going to go over for my guy. I'm going I'm to go over for him. Um, you know, just he's a remarkable athlete. You know, he's, he's, got that, he's got that will to win. And I think he's going to actually, you know, eclipse that 1250, um, probably even get up to about 13, 1400 yards this year. He, this is his senior year. He's got nothing to lose. Mm -hmm. Drew, where are, you, where are you going with? He's the definition of a playmaker. It's an easy over for me. That kid's special. Okay. I wasn't too sure tonight because I didn't know what they had to go with him. <laughs> right. But I loved his determination and the way he yep. played Absolutely. tonight. He's so I, I'm He's going over too. So it's unanimous here. We're all going to take the over. We're going to take another quick break right now. When we come back, we fire up more Nick 10 action. Conaniga against Jefferson and Belvedere against Guilford. You're watching Overtime. The Hananiga Indians are the defending Nick 10 champions, and they looked like strong candidates to repeat in their opener last week. They dominated Auburn 48-6 tonight. They took another Rockford team, the Jefferson Jayhawks. This game was played in Rockford at Wyeth Stadium. Indians already up 35-8. Thomas Costelli drops back, throws it to Cole Schmoll, who will sc scramper down the right side into Jayhawks territory. Next, the handoff to Tyler Banker, and he finds a lot of green grass in front of him, and he'll continue to keep chugging before being brought down inside the five. Next play, Castelli over to Schmall, who bobbles it, stays with it, and controls it for the catch and the touchdown. Braden Lane back for the punt return, finds some daylight, and has a very nice return into the Jefferson side of the field. Next play, Drew Shockley in at quarterback, Fakes the handoff and he's gone. He gets the touchdown to make the dagger. Hananiga takes this one 48 to eight. 
impressive win again by Hano. Let's go to Swanson Stadium where Guilford hosted Belvedere. I had a feeling the Vikings would come out playing angry after they were shut out last week by Belvedere North. Well, Bucks defensive tackle Cole Charlesworth here came out angry. He sacks Grayson Weber. But Weber keeps his cool, comes right back. Short little pass here to Halston Carter on the edge. And this is on their opening drive. The Vikings mostly, though, riding with Isaiah Primus. He caps off a 63-yard opening drive with a short TD up the middle there. We go on to the second quarter. Webster again with the short passing in game, this time to Messiah Tilson. And when he's on the edge, he is dangerous. He, look at Messiah go. That's what he can do. He's down to the 21-yard line. And uh, Weber going again to the air. Short game again. Marquarius Suggs in space, getting it and spinning for yardage there. And then when they're down there near the goal line, it's Primus once again right up the middle. He was a workhorse for the Vikings tonight. Guilford won this one over the Bucks, 21 to 7. Let's get some thoughts again from Tim. First on Guilford's performance in that game tonight. Tim, 21 to 7. That's that was a closer yeah. score than a lot of people thought that game was going to be. What do you think of the Vikings? Yeah, game? I mean, it's just you know the Vikings just need to you know they need, they need to figure it out and, and and they need to figure it out now because you know this is a second week you've come out and you really haven't actually had a really good outing on offense. So, you know, I'm not concerned about what they need to clean up over there, but they need to get it fixed quick. They got some more gears yep. that I think they just haven't hit yep, yet. Exactly. Yeah. And Hananiga was strong again tonight. The Indians are now 2-0. Your thoughts on how strong they might be this year? I think Hananiga is going to be strong. Um, you know, the impressive win tonight over Jefferson, you know, to be expected. Um, you know, but, you know, again, they don't really get into the actual – meats and potatoes of the conference for another two weeks. So it's going to be interesting what they continue to do um, week in and week out. But I definitely think they're definitely going to be standing at that one or two spot when it's all said and done. There are two Nick 10 games that will be played tomorrow. You got East at Boylan, Freeport at Belvedere. So, Tim, what about East Boylan? That matchup kind of jumps out at you. You know, I, I, I think it's going to be a really good game. I think East is definitely uh, an improved team. They're not the team that they were last year. Um, they seem a little bit more disciplined this year. Um, they have some playmakers in the backfield. I think they're going to really, you know, give Boylan a good test uh, tomorrow afternoon. Uh, you know, Freeport, Belvedere North, uh, you know, I expect Belvedere North to take care of business. You know, they took care of business going into Guilford Stadium last week. I expect them to do the same thing. They're at home. I expect a blowout. I'm going to throw this out there, too. Jaden Williams has transferred to Boylan. He's the quarterback who was at Rockford Christian last year, led the big Northern Conference in passing yards. He very well could play quarterback tomorrow for Boylan. They gave him last week sure. to learn the offense. Sure. So. Keep an eye out for that tomorrow. Absolutely. Those of you who are following Boylan or might be going to that game to see if Jaden uh, Williams does play a quarterback. All right, folks, if you want more from Tim on local football, check out the Bailey Pod. You can find it on YouTube. His guest this week, uh, it, hey, it's me. Yeah, and we have some <laughs> observations about Belvedere North and Guilford coming off that big game last week and the Nick 10 race. All right, thanks, Tim, for joining hey, us. We'll do guys. it again Appreciate next you. week. Yep. Week two All in right, the up next, it's our first uh, Spotlight feature story. I catch up with two young men who love playing on the line, Hanega's Benson brothers. Hanega always has great line play. This year, two of their top linemen have the same last name, and that's because they're brothers. Jacob and Maximus Benson, we focus on them in our Spotlight segment, brought to you by Benchmark Exteriors. It was a big boy duo in the trenches over at Hananiga, and they happen to have the same last name on the back of their jerseys. Welcome the Benson brothers. Jacob and Maximus Benson are manning down both the guard positions this year for Hananiga. Jacob is big bro. He's 6'4", 290 pounds, and in his senior season. Meanwhile, Maximus is little big bro. He's 6'2", 295 pounds, and a junior. Both of them have earned the honor of the team captain badge. I think that they are our leaders for the rest of the line. I think that... Um, a lot of the team looks to them um, as leadership because they've been there, they've done that, you know, and, uh, and they got that experience. Team leaders is an understatement for these two young men. Respect is earned, and all this hard work didn't start recently. These boys have been at it since they were little. Well, when we were younger, my dad used to always talk about, you know, having Jay Benson and M. Benson on the back of our jerseys. And I only thought we were going to play together for one year, which is this year, but my brother, you know, he put in the work for his sophomore year, and we've played together two years in a row, and we're blessed, man. I couldn't have asked for anything better. With all this hard work on the field comes with the respect they treat others with off the field. Not to mention they both have GPAs over a 4.0 grade average. 
be tough on the field, but you should also be nice off the field. And you should always kind of take the role as the leader, you know, try and inspire the other guys on your team. You know, just always be nice to everybody outside of school. You know, just try and be as compassionate as possible, no matter what, to your teammates, to your parents, to everybody. But we're like best friends, like we do everything together. So we've always seen eye to eye pretty much on everything. And we've been really close our whole life. So that chemistry is just next level, like in everything we do, whether it's video games or football, we, are, we always just have that natural chemistry. But chemistry isn't created without competition as an ingredient. Little bro Maximus gave his flowers to Jacob, even though they will always compete. Uh, honestly, ever since we were younger, even when I was like six years old, I loved to talk trash to him. You know, he was he was very sweet to me, you know, because he's an older brother. He was always nice to me, but I loved to talk smack to him, I don't lie. He, he likes to talk to me, like talk crap to me. He always has, and whenever like we line up against each other in board drill, sometimes it's the most competitive rep out of anybody I ever go against, because it, you know, he always talks about it, we always talk about it at home, and then it finally happened, and we just want to beat each other. The Bensons are those classic football players who play aggressive and tough on the field, but when off the field, they're just super nice guys. Yeah, they sure are, and it's nice to be a Hananiga quarterback or running back and have those two guys on okay. your side blocking for you. We'll be right back after one final timeout. Well, catch us again next week for overtime. Now, Fox Network will start showing college football games on Fridays next week, so we will be on right after the game between Arizona and Kansas State ends, which could be any time between 10.30 p.m. and 11 p.m., so we could be on a wee bit earlier, shortly after 10.30 or right around this same time at 11 o'clock. For another look at this entire show or for highlights of individual games, go to mystateline.com anytime. That does it for this episode. Thanks for joining us. Good night and enjoy your weekend.